Lord, thank you so much for the freedom to be here and to seek you together. We have a lot of liberties in this nation, Lord, and, and we forget until we leave and see how our brothers and sisters in the rest of the world sometimes have to worship you. And we have lots of freedom, and we thank you that for that, Lord. We just thank you for this building. We thank you for the cars that got us here, Lord. We just thank you. Um, we just thank you. We lift up this time as we explore the apple of your eye. Give us your heart. And tonight, give us your heart for Israel. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Our topic tonight is why Israel matters. Why, why for those of you who are, are maybe new here or are new to the house of prayer, you know, you walk in, why, why do we have a flag of Israel on the wall? I mean, what, what is that about? I mean, we're in the United States. Okay, we got a Mexican flag over there. That makes sense. But, but why that one? I mean, this is a country this, the size of New Jersey on the other side of the world. Why, why do we have a flag of Israel on our wall? Why do we have a whole prayer set devoted to Israel? Um, that's one of my, my duties here. Um, we have a prayer set specifically devoted to Israel. It's two hours on Thursday mornings. For those who have the time, come join me. But why? Why would the House of Prayer set aside two hours specifically for a, a people on the other side of the world? Today we're going to consider Paul's three-chapter defense of Israel as the eternally chosen people of God. We're going to go verse by verse through the Bible because I want you to realize that this is biblical. This isn't made up. This isn't my opinion. This is on God's heart. And it's something that the church at large has gotten wrong for 1,600 years. For various reasons, we can discuss at another time the, the reasons that... Uh, that the church's theology took a left turn. But the Lord is correcting it. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, this could easily be a month-long study, if not longer, with all the church history and all that. And if you're in that sort of thing, I, I encourage you to, to jump into church history to see where we've been. We learn from our mistakes. Uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I hope to explain the crux of the truth in our time tonight. Our first thing that I want to say... And I try to do all my teaching start this way. Do not take my word for it. Don't ever take a teacher's word for it. We're here because the Lord has brought something on our heart and we're eager to share it with you. But if, this, if the teacher is right, they're teaching out of the word. And even Paul. Paul said the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. They received the word with open hearts, but they double-checked him. Everything Paul said, they double-checked in the scriptures. And so I encourage you tonight, you know, if there's something that doesn't quite sit with you, study it out. Lay it before the Lord. Study it out. I, and this may be challenging to some of you, especially if you grew up in a real denominational church that either has ignored Israel or has flat-out spoken against Israel. And so this, this may challenge you. So study it out. Lay it before the Lord. Okay. Saul of Tarsus. I'm going to challenge you a little bit again. We know Paul. We say his name changed to Saul. I'm going to tell you it didn't change. He had two names to begin with. Most Jews today have two names. They have a Jewish name and they have a, a secular name that they use with the rest of us. Saul was a Jew. He was, uh, <clears throat> he was God's select man to explain Israel's Messiah to the Gentiles. He was a rabbi trained by the leading rabbi at the time named Gamaliel. Some would say he would have been the leader of Israel spiritually hadn't he, if he hadn't gone to follow this funky sect called Christians. Paul was a Jew to his death, practicing and observant. And, and you can see that in the book of Acts, that he goes to the temple to worship and he does some of the vows that the Jews do. Paul was a Jew and a Greek. He was educated in the Greek knowledge, and, and for proof of that, we have Acts 17. When he debates the philosophers on Mars Hill in Athens, he uses their own poetry against them. So Paul, that's why Paul, God prepared Paul with secular training and with Jewish training to explain to us the Jewish Messiah. 
I'm going to teach out of a translation some of you may not seen before. You can follow along your Bible. I will have the verses up on the screen. The Complete Jewish Bible is a translation done by a Messianic Jew. It is an eye-opener. We have to remember that we worship the Jewish Messiah, and we forget that. The church has stopped saying that. And it's important to, to realize that sometimes we don't understand what Jesus is doing because he's doing something very Jewish. You know, what was John the Baptist's introduction? Behold, the Lamb of God that takes the sins from the world. What does that mean to us? You know, that the Jews, that's the Passover lamb, you know, uh, and that's the lamb that they would slaughter at Yom Kippur. Um, so everything in the New Testament has a very Jewish slant. And I, 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 I want to introduce you to that so it can whet your appetite. A little bit about Dr. Stern. He was a Jew born in Los Angeles. He came to Christ at 37. He had already gone to school. He went back to school specifically to translate the Bible uh, from the Greek into English for the Jew. This is the Bible a lot of Messianic believers use. So, If you're interested in checking out the Complete Jewish Bible, it is online for free. Crosswalk.com has it in their list of Bibles. Just look for Complete Jewish Bible. And then if it really interests you, I recommend getting the commentary that goes with it where Dr. Stern explains why he translated things the way he translated them and also some of the Jewish traditions we don't get. Okay, because we're doing this Jewish slanted uh, translation, I want to introduce you to some words that you may have not seen before. And they're going to come up on our text. Ruach HaKodesh is the Holy Spirit. The Shekinah, which you may have heard before, is the dwelling presence of God. Torah is the Mosaic Law, uh, what we would know shortly as the Ten Commandments, but it'd be the whole law, actually, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Tanakh is what the Jews call the Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. They call it Tanakh. And then Adonai, another word you may have heard, that is Hebrew for my Lord. And in the Bible, it is used instead of the name of God, which we pronounce Yahweh or Jehovah. Okay, we're going to do an overview of chapters 9, 10, and 11. We won't go verse by verse because that is a lot. But that's really the section that Paul uses to, to talk about Israel. But first, I want to establish some foundation in Romans 1 for us. Verses 2 to 3. God promised this good news in advance through his prophets in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, in the scriptures. It concerns his son. He's descended from David physically. This is the gospel. This is the crux of the gospel. What is the good news? The good news is that the king of Israel came. I mean, we've got greater things about all the things that his kingdom promises, and that's usually what we present to people, is he, he offers you healing, he offers you peace, he offers you reparation, he offers you reconciliation and forgiveness. And that is all true. But why? Because he is the king. That's why he can offer it to us. That's his authority. And this good news, the good news that you see being spread in the, in the New Testament... You got to remember, they're talking to the Jews. They're in Jerusalem. They're in Samaria. They're in Judea, and they're saying, "The promised Messiah has come," and that's the crux of the good news. Yeshua or Jesus descends from David physically, which gives him the right to be the king, and he is the Son of God spiritually, which gives him the right to pay for our sins. And that's this is that's the crux. The gospel concerns a person. Yeshua the Messiah I'm going to use that a lot That's how you say Jesus in Hebrew Just so you know That's why I'm using it Yeshua the Messiah The gospel is not a creed, a law, or a set of rules A good idea, or a guide to living The gospel is good news about the kingdom It is an announcement That's what it is 1 Corinthians 15 The whole chapter is a really good summary Also of the gospel if you're looking for something written down to say, what is our gospel? What do we believe? 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, uh, Romans 1, 4. 
He, Jesus, was powerfully demonstrated to be the Son of God, spiritually set apart by his having been resurrected from the dead, and that is very important. Anything Jesus did is null and void if he didn't rise from the dead. And if you don't believe that, read 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Paul makes that very clear. He is Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. I'm going to kind of zip through this because this is foundational so we can get to what we really need to get to. And here, just so you can see how we get Jesus, Yeshua is the Hebrew. It got transliterated into Greek, and we get Yesus, and that got transliterated into English, and we get Jesus. Just so you know, just like we say Jesus on the other side of the border, we say Jesus over here. The Greeks say Yesus, and and the, the Hebrews say Yeshua. And then Christ is just from the Hebrew Christos, which is a translation of Messiah, which means anointed. So when we say Jesus the Christ, we're saying Yeshua the Messiah. And and see, that's the thing. The Jews hear, oh, Jesus the Christ, this isn't about us. And it's like, yes, it's really Yeshua the Messiah. The Messiah you've been looking for, we found him. And we can talk more about that later. They don't believe us, but that's a whole other issue. And it's up to the Holy Spirit to convince them, not us. Messiah is a word that is used in Hebrew a lot um, for priests and kings. It just means anointed one, that they were given authority. And the ultimate anointed one, with a capital A, is the Messiah they're waiting for. The one prophesied in Isaiah and in Zechariah and all the prophets. And we believe, and I, yeah, we believe that that is Jesus of Nazareth. If you want to jot these verses down really quick these are three of the major Old Testament promises of Messiah Um, you can actually preach the gospel by never using the New Testament just so you know and that's something I that's a goal I'm trying to get to the first promise is in Genesis 3 when God promises the serpent this Messiah will crush his head Um, we have the son of Judah will rule everyone in Genesis 49 and then of course the promise to David that his son would sit on the throne forever Do you need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah to be saved? The answer is in John 20. The answer is yes, just to cut to the chase. Okay, go to Romans 8 if you're following along. Uh, The transition for where we're going actually begins at the end of chapter 8. Okay, so Paul, the Paul's been telling us about that we need salvation. We're sinful. God gives it to us. And he crescendos here at the end of Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of the Messiah? Trouble, hardship, persecution, hunger, poverty, danger, war? As the scripture puts it, for your sakes we are being put to death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are super conquerors through the one who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor heavenly rulers, neither what exists nor what is coming, neither neither powers above nor powers below, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which comes through the Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. Okay, this is like one of the most beautiful passages in all of scripture. All of us hold on to this. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing, Paul is saying. Nothing. Okay, great. But there's something implied here to his readers. You got to remember, he is writing to what is ultimately a messianic congregation in Rome. It's a mixture of Gentiles and Jews. And he just said, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And the Jews are thinking, well, what about our brothers who don't believe in Messiah? What about them? Has God forgotten Israel? That's the implied question here. And Paul's going to go, Three chapters to say no. Three chapters. Okay, so what's the big deal about Israel? First, why why should we even care? Why does Paul care? Why does God care? They were entrusted with the very words of God. Paul, Paul tells us that in Romans 3. The only reason we have scriptures is because the Jews wrote it down. And that includes the New Testament, by the way. With the exception of Luke, who was probably a converted a non-Jew who converted. Every single word in the Bible was written by a Jew. God God trusted them 
to write this down. God trusted them to write this down. So that means something. That's a lot of responsibility. They were made God's children. Romans 9, 4. And there in, in Romans 9, 4, where we see the word children, it's the same word used for the believer in Christ in Romans 8, 15. So they are the children of God, just like we have been made the children of God by believing in Christ. And this one, this one is, is beautiful. Israel, my firstborn. That's what he calls them in Exodus 4. They're the firstborn. We're all in the family. But he gave birth to them first. That's why he killed the firstborn of Egypt. Because Pharaoh withheld the firstborn from God. And he says, okay, then your firstborn is mine. That's why the tenth plague. Okay. Paul is so passionate about this that you'll read. We're not going to go into that. Paul says that if he could he would give up his salvation so that Israel could be saved. Only one other person said that, and that's Moses. And he wasn't allowed to do it either. This one's big. The Shekinah has been with them. Shekinah is the Jewish idea of God's presence. And here we have this painting. This painting is at the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. And you see the little shine coming out of the, of the Holy of Holies and the, the fire going straight up from the altar. That's how the Jews knew God was there. They had a physical representation through the first temple period that proved that God was there. And that is the Shekinah. That is, that is God dwelling. It, it comes from the word for tent, and it's God making his tent with the people. And that's what we have now through Jesus, which is beautiful. But before us, God lived with them. Here's what Jews have to say about the Shekinah. I mean, the, this is from the Talmud, which is not scripture. It's Jewish commentary. But there's a lot of wisdom to be drawn there. And, and here they speak truth. The Shekinah, the presence of God, is what inspired David to write the Psalms. They understand that, that David wrote the Psalms under the presence of God. Whenever ten are gathered for prayer, there the Shekinah rests. And it's, it, for us, in the New Testament, it's two or three. The Shekinah is with us when two or three are gathered. They do it with ten. They, they won't have services unless there's ten men there. But Jesus gave us two or three, and that's just beautiful. And then also when three sit as judges, the Shekinah is with them. And, and uh, then they knew they were going to do the wisdom of God. What else? The covenants are theirs, both covenants. The, 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 the original covenant made to Abraham and what we call the new covenant through Jesus which was foretold by Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 37. He says, I will give you a new covenant. He told that to the Jews, not to us. We, we, are, we get to inherit through Jesus, but this originally was not given to us. It was given to them first. What promises are we talking about? We're talking about Messiah. We're talking about Jerusalem as the capital of the world, which is radical thought for a lot of people. We're talking about the restoration of the world that Adam gave away, the restoration of Eden. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, David, all the prophets, they were given this promise, and this is what they've been waiting for. And they are waiting today. If, if they are good, observant, Bible-reading Jews, they're waiting for Messiah today. And they're looking just like we are. And they're reading the scriptures. And they know prophecy. And they read the news. And they know where we are on the timeline. Romans 9, 6. The present condition of Israel does not mean that the word of God has failed. What present condition are we talking about? They don't receive Messiah. By and large, the Jews don't buy this Jesus thing. They don't. And they haven't in bulk since Jesus' time. They rejected Jesus specifically. They rejected Paul. They rejected the 12 apostles. They reject Jesus. Does it mean that the word of God has failed? Because he made this promise. And Paul's about to tell you, no. The word of God has not failed. Three questions about Israel's failure. 
Is God to blame? Is Israel to blame? And is Israel's failure permanent? These are the three questions that Paul's going to answer for us. When we say Israel, we're talking about the whole of God's chosen people, not necessarily the nation that exists today, but that is part of it. So that's why we have that flag. It's a visible representation of all of God's people, including the Jews that live here in El Paso and in the United States and the rest of the world. Half the world's Jews live in Israel. The other half, by and large, live in the United States, by the way. They need to go home, but we'll talk about that later. Is God to blame? And here's what Paul asks us in verses 9 through 14. Is God unjust for choosing who is saved? And why does he fault us when we can't resist his will? Paul is going back. It goes back to Paul's assertion that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So Israel has missed the signs. Did God do that on purpose? Did God do that on purpose? And Paul's answer in a very Paul fashion, is who are you to question God? <laughs> That's Paul's answer. He, he goes to the sovereignty of God. God's wisdom is far above ours. And, and the, the question of Israel is a complicated one when you start it, just so you know. When you start looking at the scriptures, you start reading other theologians, and it's complicated. And basically Paul is saying, look, it's not up to you. If you believe God's word is true, and that God doesn't go back on his word, then you believe it. And it's not for you to question what God has said. If God has said that all Israel will be saved and that they will rule with Messiah, then you buy it. That's what Paul is saying. That is what Paul is saying here. But Paul is also saying, look, the sovereignty of God is linked to mercy. God is not arbitrary. So are we to say, is it unjust for God to do this? Heaven forbid. For to Moses he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will pity who I pity. Thus, it does not depend on human desires or effort, but on God who has mercy. When we argue predestination or election and the sovereignty of God, we are showing we are afraid that God is going to be unjust. That's, that's what we're betraying from ourselves. God is not unjust. God is always going to punish sin. Over and over, the scripture says God is righteous. He only punishes those who deserve it. But Paul tells us in Romans 3, that's everybody except those who accept his free gift, his free gift of faith. There is no injustice in God. He wants to show mercy. The fact that we don't like his rules for granting mercy is what we have no business arguing about. That's what he's saying. God is just, but he's going to show mercy where he wants to and we don't have any right to question who he shows mercy to because he's showing us mercy we have no no right so we take his mercy and we spread it around so then he has mercy on whom he wants and he hardened hardens whom he wants but you will say to me then why does he still find fault with us after all who resists his will why does he fault us if he's hardening us who are you Mere human being to talk back to God is what Paul replies. And the the picture that he uses here is Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and that seems unfair. But if you read the scripture, he was given five chances to repent. Five. The first five plagues, he was told to repent. After that, God said, okay, I give you a chance. That's it. It's not, God's chances are not limitless, and we're not to question that. It, he He... He does what he wants because he's God. But he, he extended mercy to Pharaoh, and that's important to know. When people say, oh, he hardened Pharaoh's heart, he extended mercy to him. Pharaoh is the one who chose his route. Now, what if God, even though he was quite willing to demonstrate his anger and make known his power, patiently put up with people who deserve punishment and were ripe for destruction? What if he did this in order to make known the riches of his glory to those who are the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for his glory? That is, to us whom he called, not from among the Jews, but from among the Gentiles. He chose us to show his glory and his mercy. And he will save Israel in the end for the same reason. For his namesake. Because he made those promises to Israel. 
every single promise in Exodus, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, I mean, you name the prophet, he's going to fulfill it for his namesake, to show that he is a God of mercy. Is Israel to blame? Question three. We get a resounding yes from Paul. Where did Israel fail? Israel, even though they kept pursuing a Torah or a law, your Bible will say, that offers righteousness, did not reach what the Torah offers. Why? Because they did not pursue righteousness as being grounded in trusting, but as if it were grounded in doing legalistic works. They stumbled over the stone that makes people stumble. What's Israel's mistake? They had the same mistake that the church of Ephesus did. Jesus warns the church of Ephesus in Revelation. They forgot their first love. As one teacher I listened to uh, says, they got so busy with the business of the king, they forgot the king. You know, a lot of people say, oh, the Old Testament is, is, is works, and it's Torah, and it's hard, and it's judgment, and the New Testament is all grace. But if you really read the Old Testament carefully, especially David, especially David, it is all about faith. It has been about faith the whole time. Abraham was about faith. Isaac and Jacob were about faith. David's about faith. Why did they do, and Moses, why did they do what God asked them to do? Because they believed him and they trusted him. Not because they thought that the circumcision and the killing of the lambs was going to save them. They were just trusting. Sometimes, like, God asks us to do something and why do we do it? It doesn't make any sense to us. Because we're trusting. We're trusting that God is leading us on the right path. There's reasons that God asked the Jews to do what they do. And that's a whole other study uh, with the temple and, and the sacrifices and all that. But relationship with God has always been about faith. And that's what Israel, not everybody, but the bulk of Israel has forgotten. That was Jesus' indictment against the Pharisees. They were doing it to do it and to be seen. They, they looked all dead when they were fasting. They prayed on the street corners as loud as they could. Why? Because they thought it made them look good and they thought that's what would please God. And God just said, no, I want you to love me and worship me. That's all. So what is that stone that they made people stumble? As Tanakh puts it, look, I am laying in Zion a stone that will make people stumble, a rock that will trip them up, but he who rests his trust on it will not be humiliated. And he's quoting out of Isaiah 28. So what, what is the stone Messiah? The stone is Jesus, and we know that from Luke 20 and 1 Corinthians 1, among other places. And so it's the trust in Messiah. For the Jew before Christ, it was trust that Messiah was coming. And even for a Jew today, it's trust that Messiah is coming. Okay, they missed him the first time. And, and Jesus dealt with that first generation. But just because that generation missed him doesn't invalidate God's mercy on the rest. And that's, that's what we're going to see a little further along. Is Israel's failure permanent and this is this is the part that's most important i mean to me and to us as believers to put into practice this is the, the, the practical application is israel's failure permanent and the glorious answer is no and paul's going to tell us why moreover isaiah boldly says i was found by those who were not looking for me i became known to those who did not ask for me but to Israel, he says, all day long I held out my hands to a people who kept disobeying and contradicting. So here Paul is um, talking about Isaiah 65. And he's saying, the Gentile believers didn't know the God of Israel nor seek them, but we found him. Why? Why did we find him? And, 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 and Paul's going to explain to us that there's a purpose for us finding him when Israel did not. Okay, we're going to jump to Romans 11. Romans 10, if you study it out, is a bunch of hypothetical questions that Jews might ask. It's a good study if you feel, if the Lord has called you to evangelize the Jews, not to convert them, 
but to tell them who Messiah is. That's a fine line. Again, something to talk about later. Uh, but we're going to jump to Romans 11. In that case, I say, isn't it that God has repudiated his people? Heaven forbid. For I myself am a son of Israel from the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not repudiated his people whom he chose in advance. What does repudiate mean? To divorce or separate formally. To refuse to have anything to do with, to disown. So Paul is saying, has God disowned Israel? And this is the verse when people say, oh, Israel, Israel blew it. The Jews, Jesus isn't for them. This is the verse right here. Has God divorced his people? No. Heaven forbid. And the Greek is some of the strongest language you can use without cursing. <laughs> Has God divorced Israel? No. We even see that in Hosea. We have a graphic example. God tells Hosea, go marry a prostitute. She will leave you, take her back. She will leave you, take her back. She will leave you, take her back. And that's exactly what he's going to do with Israel. He has, she has left him. He's going to take her back. And Paul is very clear here. And Paul reminds us, look, I'm a Jew. <laughs> I am a Jew. And, and he, I, there are several places where he likes to list his Jewish resume, and this is one of them. I am a son of Abraham. I am from the tribe of Benjamin, and the Benjamites are very proud. No, God has not divorced his people. Or don't you know, Paul continues, what the scripture says about Elijah. He pleads with God against Israel. I deny they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and now they want to kill me too. But what is God, God's answer to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not knelt down to Baal. In the same way, in the present age, there is a remnant chosen by grace. There are Jews who believe in Jesus today. There are some in the city. Betty is familiar with those. I saw them in Israel. What a beautiful sight. A Jew back in the land worshiping their Messiah. It is one of the most powerful things I've ever seen in my life. It's everything. It's a picture of the world as the Lord intended. There have always been a remnant. There will always be a remnant. And the ones living now are probably the spiritual fathers of the 144,000 in Revelation. 144,000 evangelists. 12,000 from each tribe to tell the nation of Israel about their Messiah. There are people in this room, several people in this room who have spent time in Israel if you're interested, ask us. I'm one, Betty's one, Lori's one. I don't know if there's more. The body of, of Christ is alive and well in Israel, and it's, it's awesome. And he's moving. He's moving among the youth, just like everywhere else. There is revival coming. What follows is that Israel has not attained the goal for which she is striving. The ones chosen have attained it, the messianics but the rest have been made stone like just as the scripture says God has given them a spirit of dullness eyes that do not see ears that do not hear right down to the present day and that's uh, Isaiah 6 in that case I say isn't it that they have stumbled with the result that they have permanently fallen away and here again Paul is very clear Heaven forbid. Quite the contrary. It is by means of their stumbling that deliverance has come to the Gentiles in order to provoke them to jealousy. Have they missed it? Yes. That's obvious. Jesus wept over that fact, by the way. When Jesus is weeping on the Mount of Olives as he's riding his donkey down the Mount of Olives, and he stops to cry. Why? Why? You have missed the hour of your visitation. You did not know the time. And he wept for them. But he never said, too late, too bad. He never said that. He never said that. 
Have they permanently fallen away? Heaven forbid. In fact, the Lord, in his weird, weird logic, which I think I will never get, even if he explains it to me in the next life, he's used it for our good. He's used it for our good. Because they rejected him as a whole people, he sent Paul to us. He said, Paul, I want you to go into Europe. And man, did the fire start. It caught in Greece and just took off and took over Europe. You know, up until recently, the center of every European city had a church. What was the tallest building in the, in the, in the city? The church. Why? Because Paul obeyed. God used their stumbling to show us mercy. And I love Paul. If their stumbling is bringing riches to the world, if their messing up benefits us, that is, if Israel's being placed temporarily in a condition less favored than that of the Gentiles is bringing riches to the latter, how much greater will Israel in its fullness bring them? And that's what I mean about going to Israel or if you go into a Messianic congregation. There is just something powerful about a Jew who recognizes his Messiah. If them missing it blesses the world, how much more will the world be blessed when they finally get it and the light bulb turn comes on? That's what we're waiting for. That's when the world will be restored, when Israel finally says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Know that Israel is called of God. He knows that a remnant loves him in trust. And he always honors. He always keeps a remnant, just like he told Elijah. And he always honors that. However, now Paul's about to give us warnings. He likes to give us warnings. To those of you who are Gentiles, I say this. Since I myself am an emissary sent to the Gentiles, I make known the importance of my work in the hope that somehow... I may provoke some of my people to jealousy and save some of them. Okay, we're not to the warning yet. Paul is saying, look, I do this. You know why I preach to Gentiles? Because I want them to be jealous and say, oh, they have what we're supposed to have. That was Paul's motivation, one of his motivations. His motivation for evangelizing Gentiles was to save the Jews. He knew jealousy would provoke some to seek Yeshua. Jealousy versus envy. A little bit of grammar here. Envy is wanting something that is not yours. Jealousy is wanting something that's supposed to be yours. Right? So, you have a boyfriend and a girlfriend, right? And she sees another guy. That's envy. Oh. He's kind of cute. I wish I was with him instead. That's envy. But if her f boyfriend is with another girl, that's jealousy. Because he is her boyfriend. And now she's jealous because the other girl has what was hers. There's just That's the difference between envy and jealousy. And that's we're not supposed to make the Jews envious. We're supposed to make them jealous. We're supposed to prove to them that we have what is theirs. This is your Messiah, didn't you know? Don't you know all the promises? That he was going to be born in Bethlehem? You know? That he's going to rule the world? That's what they're waiting for. So we're supposed to make them jealous because we believe the same thing. A lot of them don't know that. Part of it is because the church has gotten a lot of things wrong. God knew Israel would fail him. Deuteronomy 32. You ignored the rock who fathered you. You forgot God who gave you birth. He said, I will hide my face from them and see what will become of them, for they are a perverse generation, untrustworthy children. I will arouse their jealousy with a non-people and provoke them with a vile nation. You know, they revere Moses so much. That's the beginning of the nation. And that's one of the last things Moses told them. Hey, by the way, you're going to miss it. And God's going to bring a non-nation. That's what we are. When you get the whole Christians, 
all the world. We don't belong to one nation. We belong to the kingdom of God. I will bring you a, a, a non-nation and arouse jealousy. We are fulfillment of prophecy. Remember that. So know that our relationship with the God of Israel is supposed to make Israel jealous. It's supposed to. Now if the challah, which is a bread, challah, no. Now if the challah <laughs> offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole loaf. I'm glad I got some of you guys to laugh. Um, I'm not putting all of you to sleep, hopefully. Okay. Now if the challah offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole loaf. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Challah is a yeast bread. We all know matzah. That's the flat bread. They use a Passover, and some of us use for communion because that's what Jesus had at Passover. But a challah is actually, they have it every Shabbat, every Sabbath. Uh, very yummy bread, by the way. But during the Feast of First Fruits, which is uh, one of the uh, one of the feasts uh, from Le- Leviticus, it's the Sunday after Passover, and they take a piece of bread and they wave it before God. And that's what he's saying. That's the example he's giving to the Jews, to the Jewish believers here. If the piece of bread is holy, then the whole the whole bread is holy. So God is holy, so the branches are holy. That's what he's saying. The root here is God. A, a lot of people say the root is Israel. I say the root here is God. Because in the next example, he's going to say, if some of the branches were cut off, that's the non-believing Jews. They were cut off. So the root here is God. And, and we get this, Jesus backed this up. I am the vine, you are the branches. Right? So if God is holy, then all the branches are holy. That means the Jews are still holy. They branch out from him. And we get grafted in. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree, then don't boast. Here's the warning. Don't boast as if you were better than the branches. And this is the difference between making them jealous and making them angry. (laughs) Don't boast. Ha ha, I have something you don't. It's not like that. Don't boast as if you were better than the branches. However, if you do boast, remember that you are not supporting the root. The root is supporting you. We got grafted in, and God supports us to this day. So you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True, but so what? They were broken off because of their lack of trust. However, you keep your place only because of your trust. We're in the tree because we have faith. So don't be arrogant. On the contrary, be terrified. For if God did not spare the natural branches, branches, he certainly won't spare you. We were told to make them jealous, but we have 1,600 years of church history of making them hate us and hate the name of Jesus. Unimaginable persecutions... The Spanish Inquisition is but the tip of the iceberg. We've done horrible things to them. Those Christians showed they did not trust. Those Christians. Those Christians showed they did not trust God, his message of grace for Jew and Gentile. They were arrogant and cruel. If you have an opportunity, again, if you feel called to evangelize the Jews, because Paul says and Jesus says, to preach to them first. Do so in repentance. Because we're ambassadors of his church. And his church has done ugly, ugly things to them. And they're taught to not trust us. And so it takes a long time to get that wall down. So if you have Jewish friends and you want to talk to them about Messiah, do so with a heart of repentance and say, you know, first of all, I want to apologize for the Inquisition and the pogroms and the Crusades and (laughs) the Nazis and you know that gets their attention when you humble yourself before them that way and then they'll be like okay let's talk about this Jesus then 
For brothers, I want you to understand this truth which God formerly concealed but has now revealed so that you won't imagine you know more than you actually do. It is that stoniness to a degree that has come upon Israel until the Gentile world enters into its fullness. And that in this way, all Israel will be saved. If Paul wasn't clear in the previous two heaven forbids, all Israel will be saved. We could mess with our heads trying to think how that is not our business. We trust. We trust. And we say, okay, God, show us. This is going to be good. <laughs> this is going to be good. Because that's one other thing you see in Israel. Very hateful Jews whose sole purpose is to find Christian missionaries and kick them out of the country. They're angry and they're hurt. All Israel will be saved. As the Tanakh says, out of Zion will come the Redeemer. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. We've only scratched the surface, but I, I hope I've, I've given you a picture into one of the things that burns in God's heart. This is, this is, this is my favorite topic. I have lots of favorite topics, but this has been paramount in my life for a year and a half as the Lord sent me to Israel. Israel is to be loved by us. God blesses those who bless Israel. Genesis 12. That is still true today. And if you're not sure, just read the news. Every time a nation stands up against Israel, they suffer something. A judgment. The Lord takes care of Israel. When it says he's the apple of my eye, that's an old translation. He's touching the pupil. When you curse Israel, when somebody curses Israel, you are poking God in the eye. Do you know what that feels like when you get poked in the eye? You know how it hurts? It's like, oh, man, that was annoying even when you do it to yourself. <laughs> That's what people do when they curse Israel. And oh my God, do you want to, I mean, if I walk up to Betty right now and poke her in the eye, she'll probably smack me. <laughs> you know, it hurts. And every day, people are jamming their fingers into God's eyes. Don't be one of them. Learn who Israel is so that you may love her. Israel gave us our Savior. And that's something that we've forgotten. You know, too many times... And, and a lot of anti-Semitism has, has been fueled by this lie. The Jews killed Jesus. And I like what Chuck Smith said. He said this at the Council of Churches in Jerusalem. He says, if we're going to blame anybody, we're going to blame me. I put him on that cross. The Jews didn't know what they were saying. And even Jesus extended mercy from the cross. Even though they said their blood be on us and our children and all the things. What did Jesus say? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. <laughs> and I think they've been forgiven. And we need to act that way. Israel gave us our Savior. Jesus is a Jew. Read Matthew. Just that first chapter, the genealogy. He is a Jew. He's more Jewish than Paul. <laughs> and Paul thinks he's it. We, the church, can have a hand in Israel's eyes being opened if you meet a Jew just be kind to them you don't have to tell them about Messiah you don't have to just be kind to them they find out you're a Christian they're like why are you being nice to me because God told me to and then you can show them show them Romans 11 I like what uh, I think I zip through it uh, David Stern the guy who did this translation why did he do this translation he said, you know, we have a lot of schisms, right? We see the Catholic Protestant schism, which is a big one. You know, the church is divided. There's a canyon there. 
we have we see a lot of things the same, but we there's other things we don't. And then you get even within there, and they've got the 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 Roman Eastern Orthodox schism, and we get on the Protestant side, and we've got all the denominations, countless. I had a Catholic one time tell me, "What's with you Protestants, man?" <laughs> it's like, how many denominations do you have? Let's not talk about that. We have all these schisms. We're broken. We're fractured. But I like what David Stern said. I saw the greatest schism in the world is the separation between the church and the Jewish people. We're over here all fractured, but really, this is the one that's huge. We have a hand. In, we can have a hand in opening their eyes, and then the greatest schism in God's kingdom will be repaired and closed forever. When Messiah comes, when when the Mount of Olives splits. You know what? Um, I'm going to finish with this just to show you how cool Jews are about Messiah. The largest cemetery, Jewish cemetery in the world, is on the Mount of Olives. You get to Israel and you're like, oh, Mount of Olives, I want to go to the Mount of Olives. Then you see it for the first time. You're like, what is that? There's no trees. <laughs> There's no trees. I've got pictures I can show you later. It's a graveyard. What is that about? You know why? Talk about faith. Talk about faith. They want to be as close to Messiah as possible when he lands. They got a front row seat to the second coming. They won't call it the second coming, but we know it's the second coming. It's a giant cemetery. They believe in the resurrection. That, that's what it spoke to me. When you see the Mount of Olives, Jews believe in the resurrection. It's awesome. They're waiting. They are waiting. And we have the good news that he's coming. That's our part. And say, we know he's coming. He's coming. And they'll look at you like, okay. <laughs> but just bless them. Just as you yourselves were disobedient to God before, but res have received mercy now because of Israel's disobedience, so also Israel has been disobedient now. So that by your showing them the same mercy that God has shown you, they too may now receive God's mercy. God wants to pour out mercy on Israel through us. Lord, I just thank you for this time. Reveal your heart to us. As people seek the scriptures to test this and to seek your heart, Lord, show them your heart. Show them that this is from you. I just thank you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.